I just watched Adrian Black's video where he repaired no less than 5 Commodore 64s, and I realized that I still haven't fixed the Commodore C game in months ago. So that's what we'll do today. What happened to number four, you ask? Well, Roman, who runs the channel Epictronics, he actually was visiting the Pacific Northwest. So we went through the pile of 64s that I had here to be repaired, and he grabbed a couple of them. Adrian gave me two Commodores. We fixed the first one right away when I got back to the studio. It had a rather silly behavior, creating weird random graphics. I won't spoil it if you want to watch that video too, but it had five bad chips. You can find the link below if you want to watch it after this video. Then I took on the second board, but didn't finish it. The board was working when I left Adrian, but when I tested it a few days later, it wouldn't work anymore. I figured one of the chips probably just died a natural death. That would have been pretty normal behavior for a vintage computer. So I didn't really prepare for that video and ran out of sockets and solder. Because, to my surprise, this board too now has multiple faults. In this video we are also going to build something from my favorite sponsor PCBOA. It's either going to be something fun, or something very useful for the C64 repair. It kind of depends on what's wrong with this machine. So far in this repair, voltages are checked and ok, and none of the chips are getting suspiciously hot. When we turned on the Commodore we had something that resembled the flash, but with distorted graphics. That turned out to be a false clue, the corresponding RAM checks OK. Lacking any other clues, I tried the piggyback method. That method isn't always working, but worth a try if the RAM chips aren't in sockets. By the way, there are no empty RAM chips or MOS logic on this board. Anyways, the piggyback method didn't reveal any bad chips. Next I tested the chips that were in sockets. CIA1 and the SID are ok, but the VIC2 chip wasn't. Now here's where it got weird, apparently this board picked up multiple faults during my flight, because we now also have 6 flashes with a dead test cartridge. I replaced U22 to get past the flashes, and that started the proper cartridge test. According to the test, the color RAM, U9, U21 and U22 are also bad. That isn't very likely to be correct, but we definitely still have a faulty chip on board. I ran the test a few times to check for consistency, and it kept changing colors. That led me to replacing the color RAM first, but it turned out to be a working chip. And that was unfortunately my last socket, so that's why the Commodore is on the bench again today. Well, I don't really have any spare VIC-2 chips, so I'm going to begin this repair by removing the can that sits around the VIC chip. This will make perfect sense in a minute. Off you go little can. And now to the repair. It's not very likely that we have several bad RAM chips. And then also something else that is causing our color RAM to malfunction. So as most of you have guessed, our next suspect is the PLA. We can't be sure of course. But it is by far the most likely chip to be bad. And the way I see it... All PLAs belongs in sockets. Since they are the most frequent part to go bad. So even if my guess is wrong... This PLA is gonna have to be replaced at some point. And this was a stubborn board. So there is still some solder left in some of the through holes. So we're gonna have to use some hot air. There we go. Now let's install a socket instead of that suspect PLA. It's a pretty messy board with tons of old flux. And it has had at least one repair done to it before. Two of the RAM chips and one of the logic chips have been replaced, or at least put in sockets. So I'm going to give this board a proper wash when we're done here. I noticed something really annoying with this board. The legs have been cut off, and that's pretty normal. But the pieces that were cut off the legs, they are still stuck to the chip. 
So I'm going to have to use my side cutters and cut those pieces off. Otherwise they are going to destroy the socket when we test this chip. And next I'm going to add a pin header to this via here. This is where you would add a reset switch if you're hacking your board. The next thing we need to do is to bend this heatsink like so. And some of you have probably guessed what we're up to. Okay, I skipped ahead a bit here, but I pulled out the working machine to try out the PLA and it wouldn't work. Turns out my S-video cable had gone broken, so composite video is going to have to do for now. So let's pull the PLA from the working machine. And by the way, this is a replacement PLA too. And this is a Signetics chip and it has a label that says Jitterman Software. I mentioned this in the first video and several viewers commented that apparently this is German and means everyone's software. So probably a company with that name replaced this chip back in 1989. So the original PLA didn't last very long in this machine either. Now let's try our suspect PLA in this freshly tested board. Okay, fingers crossed. Power on. Uh, would you look at this? I guess my guess was right. And also everyone who left a comment guessing it's the PLA. Let's see if we get the same result with a dead test cartridge. By the way, if you're messing around with Commodore 64s a lot, check out these Dell displays because they can take S-video and composite. So no adapters needed. The only thing you need is a homemade cable if you want to use the S-video. And unlike me, don't break it. And yes, we got exactly the same result. Color RAM bad. U9, U21 and U22 bad. So now we know which chip was bad. But we still haven't really fixed anything. Because I don't really have a spare VIC-2 chip or a PLA. And that is of course why I removed that can and bent this heatsink. Because Adrian also gave me his old Kawari prototype. And he obviously has the new Kawari now. So to install it on the board, we first have to add another socket to get the Kawari off the board a bit. And now it should fit. And it does. And that is also why I added this extra pin header for the reset. And I'm going to leave it in this machine. So I'm going to remove the faceplate for the joystick, the power switch and the power connector. And then I'm going to use an HDMI cable. And I'm going to route it through that hole. I guess I could make an extra cutout and use the faceplate. But I tend to avoid drilling holes in vintage computers. So this is gonna have to be good enough. So then we only need a PLA to make this machine working again. And luckily my favorite sponsor PCBWay has made me these PCBs. So let's make a PLA replacement. To build these up I'm going to use an old socket and insert my pin headers. This way the pin headers will be soldered in very nice and straight. Flux isn't really necessary for nice new boards like this. But let's add some anyways. Uh, now we only need to solder the board to the pin headers. And just making sure it sits flush. I will of course add a link below to this project. In case you need to order some replacement PLAs. I know there are several new projects for PLA replacements. So I'm not sure which one is the best. The cool thing about these is that you can actually build them yourself. I better clean that flux off right away because it won't be accessible once we put the sockets in. Some sockets need a modification to fit. Let's see if these do. No, these are fine. So if you look underneath your socket, there should be enough clearance for the pin headers. And now we can remove the PCB with the pin headers from that socket. And they should be very nice and straight. And now we can just add two sockets on top of the PCB and flip it around. 
Uh, now we only need to solder the sockets. And that is how easy it is to build one of these. These PLA replacements have been around for quite a while now. So if you have any long term experience with these boards, share down below. Next we need to download two files. You can easily find them by just googling for PLA20V8. So first we are going to download this file here for the left chip. We are also going to need this file here for the right chip. Then we're just going to fire up the XG Pro and insert the chip for the left socket. Then we need to choose the correct chip in the list. Here it is in the list. So let's load up the file for the left chip and hit program. Apparently I need to refresh my firmware. Luckily it was successful. So let's hit program and mark the chip with an L. So we don't mess them up later. Now we can insert the chip for the right socket and load up the file for the right chip. So I'll mark this chip with an R. And the only thing left to do now is to insert both chips in our board. Like so. And hopefully we now have a working PLA. Okay, let's install the contraption in the socket for the PLA. Well, it fits, so that's a good start. And then we need to reinstall the reset cable. Well, this board came without a case. And we are, of course, going to use a VIC case. And how about an amber LED? And a white keyboard. Man, that thing is bright. This case was missing the badge. So, how about a Commodore 64 badge? In a VIC case. Yeah, that looks good. Apparently I forgot. The power badge needs to be installed before the LED. That's much better. This case was actually the worst case in my entire collection. Before we restored it in a previous video. I honestly didn't think we could make it look nice. But it was the only spare VIC case I had. Luckily it turned out fantastic. It's almost mint. The C64 board fits perfectly in a VIC case, but you can't use a proper cartridge because of this ridge here. So you can shave it off, of course, but I tend not to use proper cases. I just build my PCBs and stick them into the port and very rarely use proper cartridges. And without the case, it will fit perfectly. Okay, let's see how this looks. When everything is hooked up. So let's connect the LED and the keyboard and feed the HDMI cable through the side of the case. Well, that is one bright looking case. Never seen this combination before. So, what do you guys think? The Albino 64. Okay, well, the case is looking good, but does it actually work? Uh, nothing is happening. Well, everything looks alright, and the PLA is correctly installed. Let's try that again. Oh, it works! Yes! Oh man, that is so sharp! That image is absolutely perfect. It almost looks a bit fake. Let me move in closer with the camera. Yeah, look at this. Never seen a real Commodore 64 with this kind of graphics. That project is awesome. Brand new parts for our Commodores. And not only new, in this case it's a significant improvement. Now this is only a prototype, but there is a new version of this project available now. So I will put some links below if you're interested in this project. This is going to sound a bit strange, but this image is actually too perfect for nostalgia. I'm not getting my Commodore 64 fix. Let me see what I can do about this. Well, that's much better. Or worse if you count the pixels. At least nostalgia-wise, this is much better. My last working 1084 died while I was recording the repair of the other Commodore. So I had to bring this beast out. If you wonder why this video is going to be a bit shorter than usual. Well, it took a while to recover after having moved this monster so near. I keep forgetting how heavy it is, and then I break my back every time. Unfortunately, my HDMI to composite converter is really crappy. 
so the image towards the edges here is very soft. But hey, we've got no jail bars. I also have the camera deliberately slightly out of focus to get rid of some of the weirdness created by the camera. But hey, even with my crappy converter, this is actually pretty good. To me personally, I'd say the Kawari was perfect if it had Chroma and Luma easily accessible. That is definitely my favorite way of using a Commodore 64, hooked up to a real vintage CRT display. Let's load up a few games and see how the Kawari behaves. Okay, let's give Ultron a try. Well, that looks pretty good to me. But I just realized that I haven't played this game in a few decades. So, I don't quite remember how it should look. So perhaps this wasn't the best game to try out. But if you have played this game recently on a real VIC-2 chip, leave a comment below and let us know if this looks good. Okay, let's try good old Commando. Well, this looks pretty good to me. I think the colors are a bit more saturated. But that could be the settings on the TV. Yeah, this is looking good. Yeah, that Kawari chip is doing really well. Let's try something else. Love the crack music of this era. When I was a kid, I had this stuff playing in the background when I got tired of my mother's Beatles records. Yeah, good times. Let's try Bruce Lee. My favorite game when I was a kid. I think my contrast setting is off. Or perhaps it's time to replace the caps in the Sony. And as always, wrong joystick port. that maybe the new version of Kawari has X-Video and perhaps I could hack this prototype to get some S-Video out. That is actually quite possible. Oh shit, I got stuck in the game. I'm gonna have to skip ahead. But yeah, this game played really well too, so no problems. This is composite after all, so it's not perfect. But this is way better than I had on my 14-inch TV as a kid. Okay, yeah, let's move on to what's possibly the best game ever made for the Commodore 64. This game's music is just fantastic. This is awesome. By the way, I'm recording directly from the SID. So this is the real deal. Yeah, this is looking good too. So thumbs up for Kawari. So I guess I'll do some reading and see if I can do an S-Video hack. And if you by any chance already have, leave a comment. It's probably an easy fix. Well, this video isn't going to be complete unless we play the Donkey Kong 2016 remake, of course. As soon as the 8-bit dance party ends, feel free to watch the first video where we repair the other Commodore. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. You guys are great, thank you for your support. And a special thanks to Adrian, if you want to support me too, you will find the link in the description below. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and I'll start recording the next video.